Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome. We'll begin in just a moment. Thank you for your patience. I know we're a few minutes behind, but inshallah, we will begin. I also want to welcome everyone on Instagram Live. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we are on the Rahma Foundation's Zoom uh, class. If you're not familiar with it, please check out Rahma Foundation. But we're doing a class um, called the Foundations of the Spiritual Path. So alhamdulillah, I'm on Zoom with the Rahma Foundation. I'm on Instagram Live with all of you. Thank you for being here. We'll go ahead and begin, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughliq wal khatimi lima sabaq nasul al-haqi bil-haq al-hadi ila siratik al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-azim. اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سحل إلى ما جعله سحلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إلى شد سحلا سحلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأسلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Again, welcome everyone to Foundations of the Spiritual Path Alhamdulillah We are going on, I've lost complete track I think eight weeks now I know this was only supposed to be a four week of course, but Alhamdulillah, the Rahman Foundation has extended us uh, or given us more time to be able to really give this text its proper due. Um, and so we are still at it. And I, I'm hoping, I really am, that we might be able to finish by next week or, or the following week if it if it takes too long next week. And I would actually love to have uh, a Q&A session. So maybe we'll, we'll aim for that. But with that said, I just wanted to bring everyone up to speed who may be new to the class about what we've been talking about. So this document is a wonderful, uh, we, I call it a roadmap that Sidi Ahmed Zarruq laid out for us in terms of what to look out for um, on the spiritual path. Once you decide, right? Every one of us has to make a decision at some point in our life that we are going to start taking our faith practice seriously, but it can be very overwhelming, right? Like, where do you begin? What do you do first? And of course we know the five pillars of Islam. We know the six articles of faith and we learn those things at a very, elementary level, but when it comes to being an adult practitioner of the faith, it may be overwhelming in terms of like knowledge, like who, what do you study first, what subject, and then from who, you know, who do we uh, seek uh, our tradition from, and how do we know if a teacher is sound or not? I had someone very close to me who came from the Shia tradition, you know, she uh, converted to the Sunni tradition, and so she didn't have really much foundation when it came to her family background, um, and, you know, no, she didn't have guidance from her parents. She wasn't exposed to any of that until she made that conversion. And so then it became very overwhelming. And to this day, sometimes she will express, you know, how it's overwhelming for her, even though she's been practicing for a while now, that because she's not familiar, like who are the the sound scholars? Um, and, you know, uh, even even in terms of like hadith, right? There are a lot, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, in fact, I think it was earlier today I saw from the Miftah Institute, I believe, they put together a really nice Instagram post on what is a Sahih Hadith. And this is really important knowledge that every adult Muslim should have. Um, like, how do you determine what is, a, 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 you know, if a Hadith is Sahih or if it's given a different grade, what does that whole process look like, right? Because there's, it's a very rich uh, science and there's so much effort uh, for for centuries, put into uh, put into collecting hadith, you know, and then grading them, and putting it, you know, giving them um, their, you know, I mean, writing, uh, putting them in collections. So all of these things have to be understood. So um, this text, though, what it does is it gives you some really key points. First and foremost, for yourself, like to know what your objectives are as a Muslim. You know, yes, it's to get close to God, but there are other uh, objectives as well. So he starts off with those five foundational ones, which really are about quality of practice, right? It's not just doing your ritual worship, but it's about the way that you do it. And then from there, he gives you those, the building blocks um, necessary to get to that point. So we've been, you know, at this uh, course or, or, or doing this for several weeks now, I would invite all of you to please check out the Rahman Foundation, sign up with them. They'll send you 
links to previous recordings if you want to watch them, just to kind of, again, familiarize yourself more with the text. But we're almost toward the end of it. And so today I'm going to pick up from where we left off, and I'll go ahead and screen share for those on the Zoom call right now so that you can see what I'm seeing. Um, oh, uh, I would like to please request that my sh screen sharing be activated, please. Osada, by the way, if you can do that for me. Um, and then I will uh, share so that we can see what I'm seeing. And I did, if you recall, I have um, I have a visual, uh, you know, um, these, these diagrams, I guess, uh, that I created to help us kind of visualize what these building blocks are. That's it. He uses bulleted points um, to identify certain qualities. So let's first look at the text and then, you know, I'm sorry, let me, um, can I? Yeah, I think I can. I wanted to add these onto the same window so that way I don't have to keep going back and forth. So I apologize. One second. Let me just put them. There we go. Alhamdulillah. All right. So now I can screen share. And thank you for activating that for me. And so Bismillah, here we go. So let me also zoom in a little bit here because I know it's small. I apologize. Let me zoom. So where we left off last week was where Sidi Ahmed Zarouk is now helping us to identify people who make claims, right? There's a lot of people who claim to have some uh, station with God or, you know, that they are, um, that they have certain abilities maybe, or, or you know, things that are uh, superior to maybe other people. And so he says, anyone who claims to have a station with Allah while any of the following five emanate from him is either a liar or deluded. So um, visually, uh, and I'll, I'll read them and then we can go actually, you know, it might be, it might be helpful, more helpful to just see them in this uh, order here. So what are they? What are these qualities that or claims and actions that a false or a deluded teacher would make? First and foremost, he says, allowing any member or student of his or her, we can certainly add that, into sinful disobedience. So if someone is claiming to be a religious authority or having knowledge or having studied or, you know, they have uh, ijazas and certain things and they've been given permission to teach other people, but yet the people that they are teaching, they overlook outright sinful disobedience. This is clearly a sign that there's some problem here because a true guide, a true teacher is obviously very concerned with the well-being of their students so if they wouldn't allow that certainly they wouldn't overlook it they would try to correct it and of course we don't compel people we don't do anything by force but to allow outright disobedience to take place or, or to manifest in a gathering for example you know i mean i think all of us would would agree right that if someone is claiming to be uh, a spiritual teacher, but then they have, you know, very out of character and poor character, low character behavior around them, that would be very, very odd. And, you know, again, in, in recent times, the, these types of examples may not be as obvious, but throughout history and in many parts of the world, there are absolutely these types of charlatans that exist. Um, for example, I know, I forget his name now, but you know, there was a character that came out of Turkey, I think in the 90s, he became very, very popular for some of his writings. But then we learned that he had these um, harem like environments where he had these women who I think he called dolls or he, he referenced some really, he called them very, uh, I don't know, uh, bizarre terms, but he um, he made so much money off of whatever, you know, thing, whatever he was selling that he was he would just collect these women and then give them plastic surgery and the environment was just obviously for a practicing muslim if you see a man surrounded by hordes of women who are wearing very revealing clothing they obviously had procedures done to it to modify the, their bodies that that should immediately be a huge red flag that whatever claims this person is making um, about his knowledge or his area of expertise or his spirituality would be something to question, especially if you fall under these types of, you know, cultish kind of people. So that would be um, a first sign to look out for, that they allow disobedience to happen around them. And then affectations in uh, his devotional practice. So this is also when we are, it, it, there's sort of like these theatrics that sometimes people bring to 
um, their devotional practice. So you see some, some people, and it's because they are trying to be noticed. You know, if you're looking at, let's just imagine um, areas where there are may, maybe, uh, you know, th there's a competition, I guess you could say, of, of uh, leadership, and you want to be seen or regarded as more spiritual than other people. And we're looking at, again, maybe in places where there isn't a lot of religious literacy and people are very downtrodden. And so they look to spiritual leaders for support and they want to, um, you know, feel that, that, uh, that they're, they've, you know, they're coming to people who can really help them in their own circumstances. So when someone who is in a religious, in a position of authority is bringing on those, the, those types of, you know, theatrics, they're performing their practice, spiritual practice in a way that seems very uh, convincing, right? Um, and you certainly see this uh, in different, again, groups where people will um, chant very loudly or they'll they'll call on Allah in, in ways that are just uh, jarring. You know, they can, I saw a video recently of someone who was, I think he was doing the adhan. I mean, this is not, I don't, we don't want to make assumptions about individuals, but it's just an example of how there are people who can sometimes forget, you know, that in social settings, we, we, we need to have the utmost adab and composure. And so sometimes people just enter these states, but in other times it is very affected. It's very, it, it seems like it's, it's very performative or perfunctory. So anyway, but the video I saw was someone who was making adhan and then, you know, people, someone reacted to him and he, he spooked him. He got so scared, but those types of, you know, overly dramatic, um, uh, you know, ways of, of showing that you are in some state or hal uh, is is definitely a red flag. Um, because again, if you've been in the company of, of righteous scholars, of people who have their their acumen, their history, their um, their you know uh, reputation precedes them. People know who they are because they have toiled and sacrificed and given so much for the ummah, and they've produced a lot of amazing things. You will not find these people who um, doing things like that, even if they may may reach uh, certain spiritual um, states in in a, in a gathering. They tend to be very subdued and inward. It's an inward uh, reality that may be manifesting within them, but they don't really try to show that outwardly. So that's always a concern when there's more concern with trying to display, right? So that's definitely something to look out for. And again, we want to be careful because we're giving, you know, qualities to look out for, but we also have to have the humility to know that we don't know what's in people's hearts. So use this information just generally, but not to start to presume that someone who may do something you know, um, similar to this is suddenly false. That's not fair because these are collective qualities, right? So you want to kind of see all of these in a person together, but to just kind of isolate them, or maybe you interpret someone that you already have a bias against in, in a negative way would not be right. So we always have to um, second guess our own assumptions about people, but it's good to be at least, uh, you know, versed in certain qualities to look out for them. And then the third quality that he mentions are, are so this is what he's defined, what he's defining for us are qualities, claims and actions that people who are either false teachers or deluded teachers may make. And that's an important distinction because false is like you are, you know, purposefully present, misrepresenting yourself. Deluded is something that I think would be um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's not as bad, right? Because if you're a false teacher, you're a liar. You're just flat out deceiving people. If you're deluded, it may be that you're just under the spell of your own nafs or shaitan. So you might have other problems, but they're, they're I wouldn't say that they're morally equivalent. So he makes that distinction here because sometimes they have these shared types of qualities, right? So the third one is the expectations from the creation. So what does this mean? It means that a person who is truly, um, you know, has really sound uh, and and um, strong conviction and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in their actions and their words you don't see a type of desperation that is um, is is turned to the creation right they they if they're in that state it's all to Allah they completely surrender to Allah so if they have any needs personal needs financial needs health issues 
whatever their personal circumstances are, they uh, seek for first and foremost of, uh, assistance with from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then that doesn't mean that they're obviously not allowed to seek other means, but you will notice that they don't have um, this reliance on the creation. Uh, they, they rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very clear in their words, in their sabrun jameel, right? This is why we even have that concept of sabrun jameel is because we should be able to identify that when we see that in people and certainly in our teachers, right? Um, if they are going through personal uh, challenges, then they are modeling for us, or they should be anyway, uh, modeling for us how to persevere, how to receive those challenges in the proper way. But if they are falling apart and you know they 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 show a weakness of faith and then they turn um, to the creation before they turn to God, then obviously that would be a red flag. So that's the third quality he mentions. Then the fourth one, backbiting against the people of Allah. And this is really important. And I would say in this day and age when there are so many um, you know, social media campaigns where self-proclaimed teachers uh, start to attack one another, this is definitely an, a, a, a red flag. You know, it's called punching up. Uh, this is the, the term for it when someone, for example, let's say they're, you know, uh, a student of knowledge, maybe not even um, uh, maybe that's too gener generous of a term for them, but maybe they know a little bit of, about the faith. And then they create these online, you know, accounts where they suddenly amass all these followers. And now they're critical. Now they see themselves as being on the same level, right, as a proper scholar who has the, you know, the again credentials, they went through the the path of knowledge, it's clear, everybody knows who their teachers are, they know where they studied, all of that is made clear and transparent, there's no hiding. That scholar is leagues ahead of someone who doesn't even barely know their faith, but they just have popularity, right? So this is often the case nowadays where you will see these people who unfortunately are perceived as religious guides and teachers and authorities um, who they, because of their fame uh, and the fact that their videos get the most likes and they're quite popular, they will start to create these critical, you know, response videos. So, oh, someone said something and I'm going to now respond to this teacher. How dare he or she uh, say this and who do they think they are? And then you can see, you know, we have what we call adab al-ikhtilaf, which is, you know, the, the, um, the etiquettes of disagreement. And in our tradition, scholars historically, plenty of them, many of them disagreed with each other, but they never departed from prophetic character. They 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 disagreed on ideas. So they would, you know, challenge the positions of other scholars. They would challenge their thoughts, but they didn't do it from a low place, which is to backbite against them, ad hominem attacks, slander them, bring back, you know, things that were irrelevant has nothing to do with the argument but you just want to uh, take them down right so it's called punching up and unfortunately we definitely see a lot of this in the social media space so if you follow someone whether it's on tiktok instagram facebook wherever you're following them twitter and you see post after post where they are actually attacking other scholars especially if they're young and they're attacking senior scholars I would say be very cautious of those types of people. They tend to be very charismatic. They use logical arguments. They sound so convincing, and they'll weave together these very, um, you know, um, these very uh, complicated or or, or um, uh, you know these videos where they have all these you know references, and and so they'll try to create a story, right, a narrative. And so it seems very convincing, but this is why it's so important that we heed the warnings that were given in our tradition, which is to verify information, not to fall for uh, a story that is woven for you, right? Because people, uh, they have you know their own biases and they will cherry pick in order to create the image that they want others to have of whoever they're attacking. And so you have to have the discernment to say, first of all, anybody who does that that's that's definitely a red flag. When do you see real, you know, real scholars or people of Allah 
uh, wasting their time on things like that. Now, if a person is um, really misguiding people and they are causing a lot of fit and harm, that's a different scenario. This is just a matter of difference of opinion, right? Like we, when we have due process too on how to deal with those types of characters, but we're talking about just someone who doesn't like another person or another like person's position. And instead of debating the idea or providing counter arguments and proofs against whatever is being said, they take it to the low level of backbiting and you know spreading false lies. So we really wanna be careful about that. And that's the fourth quality. And then, he mentions the last one, which is lacking the proper respect in accordance with the commands of Allah. So this is, you know, very important too. And I think actually lacking the proper respect, I think this should be towards Muslims. Let me check. I may have mistyped uh, here. I apologize. One second. Yeah. So lacking the proper respect for Muslims in accordance with the commands of Allah. So when, when a person again is in a position of leadership or uh, knowledge, and then they are speaking about other believers. It might not be a scholar, but maybe they're, you know, um, they're speaking of groups collectivizing and just disparagingly describing other Muslims. Um, this is also an absolute red flag because the people of Allah, people of Taqwa, do not. Uh, they're very cautious with their own state with Allah. They don't want to take chances. So how would you defend someone who? is, you know, they're a little too loose lipped, you know, and they start to speak about groups or ethnicities, it could be racially charged, it could be charged from other, uh, you know, um, perspectives, but it's wrong, because anytime you collectivize or, or stereotype or use these types of, um, you know, foul ways of speaking about groups or individuals, that's just showing your own diseases, right? It's, it, it doesn't, I say anything about the groups you're describing you're you're at fault you know and so that that would be unbecoming unfitting uh of someone who's a, apparently or supposedly a scholar so these are the five qualities that he's outlined for false and deluded teachers now he does something interesting because if you look at the document which i'll go back to here on the zoom call you see that he jumps from these five qualities right to the qualifications of the spiritual guide. So now he, he's told you what to avoid. Like if you see people like this, they're either liars or delusional. Now he, he switches gears and gives you the qualifications of the spiritual guide with whom the seeker may safely entrust his uh, self. So now we're gonna pivot to what qualities you should look for, right? So those are the ones you don't want. So it's interesting and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. But here are the qualifications that he outlines for real teachers. He says, first, unadulterated spiritual experience. So it's the opposite, right? In the beginning, he was talking about these affectatious sort of, you know, performative displays during spiritual devotion. Now he's saying, no, none of that. You just see pure, you know, uh, ritual, you know, if, if it's their prayer, if it's their recitation of the Quran, their dhikr, whatever they're doing. It's there's no nothing that makes you feel like, you know, icky, I guess, you know, there's sometimes you're you're in a gathering or you might be with groups that there's something just doesn't feel right. Right. When you're with people of taqwa and real sound scholarship, everything is um, is is clear because it's from the uh, tradition. It's not innovated. It's not introduced from themselves. It's something that you could easily uh, read in the sira, or you know that there's textual proof and evidence for it. It's unadulterated, it's pure, right? And that experience uh, you have just being in their company um, is 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 very clear. And so you'll never feel odd being in their presence. And then sound outward knowledge. So again, a person um, who who makes a claim or claims to be, you know, a spiritual guide or a teacher would have the knowledge to back that up. They would be able to cite certain, uh, you know, proofs and evidences. They should certainly know portions of the Quran, the Hadith. They should be able to speak in a language that is clearly distinguishable from the average person because the way that they speak is informed, right? Knowledge uh, is something you acquire. So their knowledge is, is something you can test and prove just by asking certain questions. Um, and you don't have, they're not, it's not double speak. It's not um, a way of, of presenting that's just very, 
you know, full of, of, of ornamentation and eloquence, because this is one of the, the qualities that we're also warned about, right? During the end of time, that there will be many people who are very well spoken, but they are devoid of knowledge. So, but they actually do reference and they cite. And I know our teachers always remind us to provide uh, sources, right? When you're teaching, when you're speaking, writing, whatever you're doing, cite your sources because you want to, first of all, you know, show that that you know what you're talking about. It helps your credibility in general, but also because it's an amana, the transmission of knowledge is very serious, right? To be in a position where you are teaching other people, you have to be so careful because your uh, words, right, are everything is being recorded and a teacher is not uh, absolved of the responsibility that all of us will be are, are responsible for, which is what emanates from our tongue. In fact, they, they have to take themselves even more to task because of the reach that they have, right? If I'm my myself and I'm not really impacting other people, then the only harm that I could produce would be for myself, right? But if I'm in a position where I have nowadays, it's not even just, you know, 10, 15, 20 students, uh, we're looking at by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands. And some people, if you're looking at global reach, you know, some scholars have students that are in every corner of the world, whether they know about them or not, they're watching their material religiously, um, pun intended, they're looking at, um, you know, all of their, their socials, they're following them everywhere they go. So these are devoted people. And therefore, all of these people could make claims, you know, against these people in the day of judgment. Well, I heard this from so-and-so. So if you're not citing your sources and just speaking from your own self, it's very dangerous. And that's why a real teacher cites sources. They show and demonstrate knowledge clearly. So that's the second quality. The third is celestial aspirations. And if you go back to the you know beginning of the document, you'll remember that this is also one of the prerequisite, prerequisite qualities of the foundations, the original foundations, is that you actually have to aspire beyond this, this worldly realm, right? If you're dunya oriented, your goals in life are dunya oriented. You're just looking constantly at whatever you can get here and you're not thinking of the next world and not trying to push yourself to have the highest uh, you know, aspirations, um, then that's a problem just for the average Muslim. So what about then a teacher? So they should also be speaking about the akhirah and really directing themselves and their students to think of the next world, right? And how um, everything we do should have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure in mind before we give in to our own nufus, our own lower selves, because that's where the delusion of the self manifests from. It's the, the desire to just give in to your own self. Whereas when you have celestial aspirations, you're willing to go against yourself, right? Mujahid and nafs, jihad of the nafs is to go against yourself because your goals are that great. You know, you want uh, Allah's pleasure. So you'll wake up in the middle of the night, you know, because your sleep, although you love to sleep and sleep is great and we all want more of it, you realize that um, that time that has been allotted for the du'a mustajab and that beautiful connection with Allah is much greater. So you will go against yourself and in other ways too. When you, whenever there's choices to be made between something of the dunya, giving into some, you know, uh, nafsi impulse or something that's better that you will, um, you, you'll fight, you'll at least resist it. You'll think about it. And with practice and time, eventually, inshallah, we can overcome these things, right? Um, if you, for example, uh, you know, have have time in the middle of your day and you uh, are driving, let's just say, this is just a very simple example for the average person to think about. You're driving and you have extra time um, and you have not done any reading of the Quran. You have not done any dhikr that day because you got up early, you did your prayers maybe, but then you were off to work or off to school. And now you have like a half an hour break or an hour break. We sometimes, you know, get in our vehicles or get in a private space and instantly the phone comes out and we either start scrolling social media or maybe we pick up the phone to call someone and just start chatting, idle talk, gossiping, whatever. 
or maybe we like to watch uh, or listen to certain music or watch certain, I mean, people have, you know, they have, they're very committed to certain programs and, and series that they watch. And they'll, I know some people who watch on a repeat, you know, they have collections of, of past episodes of certain shows or whatever, and they'll watch it. Um, Law and Order, you know, I remember, um, what's that medical show? Grey's Anatomy. Oh my God. I think they're still, they have like so many fans who will continuously watch these things. Like they'll just repeat. I've watched it five times. And I'm just like, how, how, subhanAllah. But there are people who are very, very obsessed. You could call them fans of certain um, you know, genres or types of cult classic shows or films. So if you have time, Allah's giving you extra time and you have those things are on your periphery and your periphery, you're kind of thinking about them. But then you realize it hits you, right? That I haven't done any Quran today. Haven't, and I'd likely, I'm going to get busy. I'm going to go home. I've got this to do, that to do. Maybe right now I should, you know, listen to some Quran, do some dhikr, do some salawat. And you actually start thinking on that level. Eventually, if you keep listening to that voice inside of your heart, that's reminding you, right? And sometimes this could be also the angelic realm because we do have protective angels who will nudge us along um, to do better, right? So when you get those types of thoughts, don't ignore them. You know, if you ever wake up in the middle of the night and it's like two, three in the morning and it's just random, it happens to all of us, but you realize like this was... You didn't set your alarm. Maybe, maybe there's wisdom. What happened? Why did you just suddenly wake up from your deep sleep? And a thought comes to you that says, maybe you should get up. You know, maybe you should get up and pray the hajjud. But then there's another thought that says, nah, go back to sleep. You're too tired. You got to wake up in the morning. That's the internal struggle between the forces of good and, and evil within us. And so eventually, though, if you keep entertaining that thought of maybe I should, you will, uh, inshallah, it'll you'll you'll gain mastery over your nafs but you have to be willing to entertain that right and so that's a important thing to do but just generally speaking uh for the for the back to the document for for a teacher a real teacher these types of things are obvious right that they are always guiding us to the best course the best course the course of the prophet so i said of a course because he's the best of examples so they're always reminding us of these things inshallah and then he mentioned, so I'm just going over uh, the foundations of the spiritual path where Sidi Ahmed Zarouk is talking to us about the qualifications of real teachers and what to look out for when you're seeking a guide or a teacher. So he mentions uh, five qualities. So the fourth quality here is a pleasing state. And this is really uh, beautiful because it's so true. Like, I, you know, I know I can uh, speak on behalf of other people that I know very close as well who've had this experience where when you meet people who are true, uh, truly people who are rooted in the tradition and they, it's evident, it's evident because you can't help but be drawn to them. It's like this magnetic force. And you're just like, subhanAllah, I don't know what, how to define this feeling, but I feel this, this, um, the spiritual magnetic draw to this individual and it's because they have beauty they have nur they have light because of the knowledge that they're possessing and that is transmitting it's transmitting in their words it's transmitting in their gaze it's transmitting in their state they look beautiful they speak beautifully um they're everything they just and we're not talking about you know physical beauty in this in the worldly sense we're talking about spiritual beauty that's manifesting through them right through their physical form uh, and so the and i remember i mean i've had this experience several times with different teachers uh male and female uh one of the first times i ever no the first time excuse me the first time i ever met with a, a very well-known uh sheikha uh teacher um i remember myself and my friend we went to go listen to her for the first time and she wears niqab. She's very shy, mashallah. May Allah protect and preserve her. But her state is, it's like honey. <laughs> She's just so, it's so sweet that you can't like help but fall in love with her. So imagine meeting someone, learning from them for the first time and just loving them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like you can't even help it. But I, um, 
like I said, first time I ever met her, first time I ever saw her many years ago, she uh, she she removed her niqab because it was all women. And we saw her beautiful face, her smiling face, just like the sunnah of the Prophet And that was instantly what I was reminded of, that this woman is, is displaying prophetic qualities because she cannot speak without smiling. And her smile is just so beautiful that you're just drawn to her. You know, she just has this magnetic ability. And then of course her words, I mean, they're like pearls just uh, dangling, you know, and you want to hold on to each one of them. And I just found myself getting so emotional because she had such a effect on me. And I thought I was the only one, you know, sometimes you, you're already maybe going through something in life, in life that's difficult. And then you hear a speaker or hear a teacher or hear someone and and because you're already vulnerable in that state, maybe they're tapping into something, right? That this is a very real thing that happens to people. But when I, you know, left with my friend, we both were like in a car ride, like, oh my god, oh my god, that was so amazing. So I knew it wasn't just me, and that's the experience that I, because other friends were there as well, that we all started to talk, and it was like this. We all had the same experience. Like, there's something about her, and to this day, could, you know, there's people that you can listen to a hundred times, but they always. Uh, managed to have that effect on you. I'll say it like Sheikh Aisha Prime, I love her, I love protect and preserve her. I think we all um, who've heard her and who've met her feel that way about her. She absolutely has a beautiful way of just um, connecting to the heart directly, especially if you're with her in like in, in physical proximity. MashaAllah, it's just a gift, may Allah protect and preserve her. Um, but those are the types of, of realities that Allah will show upon his uh, his servants who are really pure hearted and and they're uh, you know they're 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 rooted in the tradition and they're not the ones that we're talking about before right so they have that pleasing state and as I said this is agreed upon by those who are in their company so that's the fourth quality and then the fifth quality is the penetrating inner perception or simply basira right that a real teacher has a knowledge a sixth sense. Um, something that is beyond the, you know, what, that they have this percept perceptivity that that um, that makes them very obviously different. Like you, it distinguishes them apart from others. Right, the, the, the way that they speak. Sometimes they may even speak about things that have yet to materialize. You know, because they have a foresight that the average person doesn't have. They'll be able to. Um, you know, just because of their knowledge and their experience, you know, when you're speaking to them or listening to them, they're able to, again, offer insights into uh, into things that that just are, are obviously different. Right. Um, and, and I, you know, again, if you've if you've ever had the honor of being in the company of these types of teachers, you'll know what I'm talking about. But sometimes, you know, you, you could be speaking to them or they're just speaking and all of a sudden they'll have some type of ilham, like this you know this knowledge that just will come to them in the moment and then they'll say something and you're just like subhanallah wow how did you come up with that you know like how did you come up with that and I recently had this experience with uh, with our teacher Sheikh Hamza where he said something and I just was like my jaw dropped because it was such an incredible insight but these you know these are you know, signs that mashallah Allah gives to, to whoever he wills. And so it's happened before with him. But in this particular case, I just remember kind of being stunned, like, Allahu Akbar, that's just incredible, like that you came up with that idea. And he said, Oh, yeah, just, it just, it just came right now. <laughs> I'm just like, Ya Allah. So this type of perception, this basira, this ilham, these are things that are gifts that Allah gives to sincere people. But, um, you know, th these are ways that you can recognize the, the people from that are truly, again, rooted in the tradition. And I would also say, I mean, it's not explicitly stated here, but I think it's so important in this day and age to look at credentials. Credentials do matter. And real teachers should be very forthright about their uh, teachers and about whatever knowledge they have, or if they have uh, completed certain um, paths of study that they make it very clear uh, if they've received ijazas, that you would not need to dig or ask multiple people because it's known knowledge. Um, but if someone is, again, purporting to be uh, a spiritual guide or a teacher and you have no clue where they studied, with who did they study, and you don't really have um, a lot of insight into who they are personally, red flag, 
red flag. Um, actually, uh, just recently, I, I was with some family and I made mention of something just jokingly and someone responded that, oh, you remind me of this, um, you know, this, he, he called her, I think, a scholar. Yeah, he said, you remind me of this scholar, this, this the scholar of this video I saw. And have you seen her? And then he starts talking about her. And as he's describing her, I instantly knew who he was talking about because she uh, stirred some controversy recently. And he, he, he was saying that what I said reminded him of something that she had said. So as soon as he identified her as a scholar and then went on to describe who she was, I was like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Because I was like, no, 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 she's not a scholar. Safrullah. I mean, she's someone who, um, like I said, stirred a lot of controversy on TikTok and like maybe a month or so ago. And I don't want to get into the details, but she is definitely not a scholar, but she started to make these viral videos, very controversial topics, making a lot of you know statements that she knew people were going to react to. And that's exactly what happened. People started sharing her, reacting to her. To her. I can't believe this. Have you seen this video? It caused actually a lot of fitna. Um, but unfortunately, this person that I was talking to, he was not aware that she was actually, you know, perpetuating a lot of harmful things and, you know, positing herself as, I mean, I don't think she ever said that she was a scholar, but the way that she was speaking, you know, get, telling people how to conduct their lives was in a way, um, you know, the same. And so anyway, I had to kind of warn him. So this is the danger of not knowing people's backgrounds is that, there's some people who can come on and sound very convincing, but you need to, you, it's on you. You have to do the due diligence to find out more about them and seek out, well, wait a second, what institutions do they learn from? Which teachers do they learn? Do they complete any of their studies? Um, is there anything of concern that we should know about them? And usually uh, people do uh, no you know there are there will be um if there's any words of uh concern or anything of concern you will get wind of it if you ask but if you're just going to take it for face value that's very dangerous so these are the um qualities now i said earlier that what he did what Sidi Ahmed Zidur did was interesting is because he jumps from right the claims and actions made by false deluded teachers to the qualifications of real teachers and then he goes back to the qualities of false teachers. So I thought that was interesting because you know, he starts by, I think, kind of uh, you know, um, warning us about these delusional people, right? That, that again, they could be liars, they could be um, deluded, we don't know, but at least like look out for these red flags. Then he helps us to discern between those people and uh, the real teachers, right? So now we have a clearer picture and now he jumps full into the qualities of a false teacher. Like this is it. This is what you absolutely need to stay away from. So someone might have certain red flags that were mentioned before, but if they have any of these things, forget it. This is the, the, the these are the qualities that you absolutely have to warn against. And so again, on the Zoom call, I've, I've paired them together because I think it makes um, for me anyway, logically, just to be able to be able to connect the false teachers with the deluded teachers in a way so that you can kind of see the similarities and qualities. Ignorance of the religion, right? And again, this is the opposite of what we just covered. To have sound outward knowledge is not to be, is not the same as to be ignorant of the religion. So if they just don't know, you ask them certain questions and they don't know. Um, and it's okay, by the way, you know, uh, to, to say la adri or I don't know, Imam Malik, uh, that was his position, you know, that, that that's a sign of actually someone's intelligence, that they don't know certain things. So we're not talking about not having all of the knowledge on hand at the moment. But, you know, because there's sometimes, you know, people have a difficult time retaining, uh, but they, they've studied it, they know it, maybe they don't have the exact source, or they can't give you verbatim a particular answer. Um, and so in that case, that's very different than being completely ignorant, you know, that they are giving you false guidance, they're giving you the wrong message, they're they're misguiding you, right? So ignorance is different than not knowing something. I want to just make that clear distinction. And then the disregard for the reverence of other Muslims. So very similar to, right, the lacking of the proper respect, this last category of deluded teachers. If you don't believe that Muslims deserve your respect, right? Like if you walk in and, um, you know, you're, you're apparently this amazing teacher and there are people 
you know, wanting to say salams to you or greet you or or somehow, you know, they want to be in your in your orbit, but you see yourself as too important and you're just walking past people, you're kind of, you know, dismissing them. You don't want to talk to others. I mean, there is, there's definitely um, a danger, right? That when you become, when you rise to fame and popularity, that you start to look at down at people. And this is absolutely something that happens to uh, many people, whether they're celebrities or people of authority or, or or in this case, religious authority, it can happen to them. So that's why we have to constantly guard our heart from you know, looking down at people, but just not even having any respect or appreciation for, for Muslims. And again, falling into the same behavior we talked about earlier would definitely be a huge sign of a false teacher engaging in matters of no concern to him. This is also very important because again, this is a foundational principle in Islam, right? That part of the beauty of one's Islam, right? Yeah, um, the, the part of the beauty of one's Islam is to leave that which does not concern you or to mind your own business. So if you are a busybody, you want to know people's, um, you know, you're, you're, you like gossip, you want to know what's going on with other people, you're always asking and, you know, trying to um, pry and get information from other people, or just in general, you're, you're not focused on your own, um, you know, whatever you can, you know, your own projects, your own life, but you're more concerned with other people, that's definitely a red flag, because just again, as a principle, as a foundational principle for the believer, we're supposed to really stay away from uh, you know injecting ourselves into the business and lives of other people. And so that should be a clear red flag. And again, if you're around people of real serious uh, scholarship, they don't want to know private matters of other people. They're not in it for, they're, if you're in a gathering with them, even if it's a social like uh, you know experience, they're not asking these trivial questions to try to um, you know figure out what's going on in other people's lives. They're actually very deliberate about what they talk about. And you'll hear, inshallah, I mean, you'll hear a constant reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll hear talking about important things and reminders, and they'll try to draw stories and, uh, you know, whatever it is, but they're always in that mode of, of teaching and being very, very deliberate and intentional about the time that they have with other people. So they're not going to waste it and squander it on talking about nonsense, right? So that's a very important quality. And then following his caprice in his affairs. So again, um, a real teacher is not someone that's directed uh, by their their uh, shahwa or their desires or their caprice. Um, they are directed by right and wrong. They have taqwa. So they're looking at, you know, what is the right course of action? What is the best course of action? Not that fulfills my needs or my wants and my desires, but that is um, the best in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best in following the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best in the mutual benefit to other people. So they really take their decisions seriously and what they do seriously. And then the, la the last quality, he says, unashamed displays of bad manners, followed by lack of remorse. This is key because to have bad manners is so antithetical to being a Muslim, right? We adab is, is so important in Islam. And if you don't have the right comportment, the right way to conduct yourself, you don't even know what that looks like, then you cannot be in a position of teaching, right? If you're, if you're, and, 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 and we could say that all of these qualities that we've talked about would fall under, under the general description of just lack of adab, because adab is, is, is the, you know, you, when you have adab, you are constantly in a state of, again, what is the proper protocol? Because your taqwa is what is guiding you, right? Adab is knowing the protocols of situations. So if you don't even know the basic protocols of how to talk to people, how to be in the company of other people, and you're displaying bad adab, right? You speak again lowly. You're not polite, you don't thank people, you don't show grace, you don't show those prophetic, beautiful virtues. And when you slight people or you do something that would be a clear breach of adab, you don't even display remorse. Certainly these are huge, huge neon sign red flags, but those are not people that we should take as 
true teachers, but rather maybe again, they've fallen into popularity and fame and people just like what they say, but that doesn't make them qualified as a real teacher. So I've, again, on the Zoom, for those of you who are on Instagram, I'm also on Zoom with the Rahma Foundation and we have um, these visuals that I think help. Sorry, I think I jumped ahead. What did I do? I don't know what I did. I apologize. Um, so, but but yeah, so he mentions those, um, Bismillah, hear this. So this is the text that goes with, with what I just shared. So he mentions these qualities as they cannot be a true spiritual guide. If you see people like this, flee. Don't even go near them because they're very dangerous. And in this day and age, again, where there's so much confusion and unfortunately a lack of real, we have a crisis of knowledge uh, in our deen, it's very easy to be deluded by these types of people, right? And so we want to um, know these signs so well. So I'm sorry, I think we have a few minutes left on, on Zoom anyway. I'm going to stop to allow for any Q&A um, and we'll try to finish. Alhamdulillah, we got to uh, three sections today, which is good. Um, this is going to help us move along. I know Sada Fadwa and others, I'm sure you have your summer plans. I do not want to in any way um, impede or, or affect your plan. So hopefully we'll try to wrap this up maybe in one or two more sessions, inshallah ta'ala. But uh, Sada Fadwa, are there any questions um, for today? I don't see any in the Q&A. Um, if anybody in the audience has a question, please put it in the Q&A. Inshallah, we can start taking some of the questions. But we do have somebody who has their hand raised. Do you mind oh, putting the question in the Q&A or uh, depending on your preference? Um, I don't phone. mind, Inshallah, if, she, if she'd like to come on the mic. Um, sister, I, I can hear you. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm on the, let's see here. Sorry, I'm looking at uh, Instagram to see if there's any questions that I missed here. So go ahead, uh, Sister Sophia. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Jazakallah khair so much. I really enjoyed the, the session and I appreciate all the insight. And, you know, I loved how you were able to put this in perspective for a lot of us who are starting our journeys as well and how we're trying to equate the information, the, the slew of information, the flood of information, the overload of information that is out there. And especially when it comes to, you know, and how you kind of have to put it in perspective. And subhanAllah, Islam gives us all those guidelines and the adab of it as well, you know. So for me, I've been struggling with this for quite a bit and I've been blessed enough. I'm going to say this is one of the blessings of Allah in my life that I've been able to found Rahma Institute and found you and found all of the, every you know, everything that comes with that. And uh, anybody who feels, you know, that this is a journey that's really heavy and then it discourages you, I think you just have to look inward and reassess your intention. You know, it goes back to that hadith where you're supposed to uh, assess your intention at the beginning, middle and end. And this formula works so well. It works amazingly well. So Jazakallah khair. I really wanted to just voice my gratitude towards, you know, the effort and, and the insight. And I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I'm always sending you my, <laughs> my love from the, from the, you know, from the East coast all the time. <laughs> so I, I really do appreciate it. Jazakallah khair so much. And it's really lovely to hear you always. Jazakallah so much. Hey, Jazakallah khair. And what a mashallah, beautiful and generous and kind testimony. Thank you so much. It's always lovely to hear from people on the other side. Sometimes when we're talking into these cameras, it feels very uh, isolating, but I appreciate the feedback so much and your support. I know for myself individually, as well as the institution, Rahma Foundation, it means so much. And I'm so glad you mentioned this because I feel like for a lot of people who are on the beginning of their journey, this is why it's so important that we support our organizations because a as an organization like Rahma Foundation, I know there are a lot of them out there now, but if you look at their origins, if you look at their teachers, if you look at who their teachers' teachers are, all the things that we talked about in today's session will be immediately resolved because everything is transparent. The, the people are known and they have enough um, you know, mashallah, uh, you know, credentials and also their reputations, as I mentioned, uh, precedes them just by virtue of what people have to say about them, that you feel like you're in a safe space with your with your spiritual, you know, heart. I mean, the most important thing that we have is our heart. And so alhamdulillah, that's why I love this organization. And they didn't ask me to make this pitch, but I just really appreciate that they gave uh, us the opportunity to come together as they always do, especially as women. 
to learn from one another. And so Alhamdulillah, but thank you for your continued support and your kind words. Really, really appreciate that, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, such a blessing. We do have a question from online. What is the proper adab as women in approaching the shiuf to ask them questions when we're in their presence? MashaAllah, that's an excellent question. Alhamdulillah, and sister. You know, there's a lot of difference, uh, um, well, not difference of opinion, but there's different things that you hear depending on who you ask. You know, we know that the people of Medina were praised for being people who did not let their shyness, right, prevent them from asking. And so this was something that Sayyidah Aisha definitely mentioned so that we as women know that we should not feel shy to ask. I mean, they would ask her to ask the Prophet some very specific questions with, the, with, the, with regards to demonstration and other very private matters. So you can imagine that that's definitely a position and we, we can certainly take that position. But then there are other people who would say that it really depends on the teacher. You know, there are some... Uh, you know, the relationship between the student and teacher has to also be maintained. So I would say, for example, if it's a, a question that you can, um, that's very private to you, and maybe even, uh, you know, something that's, that's personal that, that you would want to, um, you know, seek advice on, I always advise people to speak about things in the third person, it's actually better. If you let's say you're having a marital issue, let's say there's something that's going on, it's it, when you're dealing with the male teacher, it, especially if it's like you don't have access, you're not sure if you're going to be able to get the answer from anyone else, then don't make it personal to you. OK, and there, there's several reasons why. But I just feel like sometimes in the moment we forget um, that, you know, people are are that if we reveal too much. Right. Let's say you're someone in the community and you need to get a question, clear question. And, you know, it's about your personal life, you know, your your family life, um, that these could th be things that somehow, you know, come back people from telling too much in those types of impromptu Q&A settings, when you can opt to just uh, ask on behalf of someone else, or if there's a written Q&A form to just write your question anonymously, um, because preserving reputation, preserving the honor of your family, your husband, your children, whoever is involved, your in-laws, even if you're really upset with your in-law, right? We get so angry. We want someone to root for us. We want them to advocate for us. So we're just going to go and tell them everything, right? But in the moment, because you're emotional, you might feel that way, but maybe five years down the line, you've forgiven, all is forgiven, everything's fine. And now this teacher is there and they may remember these things. And so I always feel like we have to be um, really wise when we're in these types of situations to cautiously ask questions and know the, the boundaries, right? And so part of that would be to protect one's reputation at all costs certainly ask the question, but if there's an opportunity to do it anonymously, do it that way first. If there isn't, then I would say be wise and say you're asking on behalf of someone. You know, that you know someone who's going through this and you wanna be a good help to them. And you can give all the details that you would normally give, but just that simple framing, what it does is it takes out the emotionality that would otherwise compromise you. The emotionality is what I, uh, I fear because I feel like sometimes um, we let our emotions get the best of us and we we want vindication. We want someone to make us feel good, but we then may feel the repercussions of that later. So you can still get all of that validation uh, anonymously. And I would I would say that would be the best way. I'm sorry, it's a very long answer, but I hope inshallah that that helps you. What's that, Fadwa? Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, the next question says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I was really rejuvenated by a particular teacher and that an individual offered a retreat in conjunction with an individual teacher that I did not know. I looked that individual up and the credentials were not really sufficient. When I inquired about these issues, I was told the other one was on was famous on Instagram. I did not go to the retreat, but many in the community did. Is there anything else I should do to caution others about lack of credentials? So checking credentials. Sure. No, Jazakallah khairan. Um, this is a, a great example of someone, mashallah, who used sound judgment. And I want to applaud you because, you know, when you 
put your time towards seeking spiritual knowledge, you're going to leave your family or you're, you know, you take a break from work or whatever it is. You really want to make sure that what you're investing in is going to yield something positive. And if you had gone uh, knowing certain things, then it may have really caused a conflict in your heart, but you made a choice, mashallah, based on your own, um, you know, conscience and inshallah that there will be immense reward for you. Now, as far as the, the people who are organizing, if you brought it to their attention that this is a concern and they are still um, more maybe uh, invested in, in, you know, trying to garner, because um, sometimes if you if you are an organizer, you're looking at what's going to attract, right? The headline speaker, the more popular speaker will maybe attract people to the program that sometimes, unfortunately, some people put that before the quality of the teacher or these types of very serious considerations like credentials. So unfortunately, if the organizers fail to act upon your recommendation or at least advice or concerns, and they're just kind of giving you their position, then, you know, at that point, it's on them. You've done your part. Um, you could personally still advise your close friends, but I would caution against being, you know, the, the, the one who's now going to warn everybody, because that's also another dangerous element that I think has creeped in, where sometimes people want to take on these big issues, but then they end up being hurt the most. You know, when you um, raise concerns about organizations, especially in a public way, uh, and people aren't ready to receive that, or they have more supporters, you're one individual, this is a group, people quickly turn, and it can be horrible to the person who actually was just trying to sound the alarm because of, out of deep love and concern for their fellow community members, they end up bearing the brunt of um, a, 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 an immature community who, that, who doesn't realize maybe that um, that you know it was in their best interest. So I would say don't take that on. Your responsibility is to let the organizers know what your concerns are. They are the ones who are held accountable for putting up uh, these types of people. But you personally can absolutely, in your own circle of again trusted people, warn people and just keep it you know minimal. Because one of the, um, the models that I uh, really appreciate from our teachers who taught us. That, that I think is so effective, and you can apply this to any area of your life, is learning about what we call the sphere of influence and the sphere of concern, okay? This, so just imagine like concentric circles, right? Concentric circles are like circles within a circle. All of us have to know what our sphere of influence is, which means what can we really impact in our own way, like in what, what has Allah given us to be able to do, right? And then we can, we have a different sphere, which is the sphere of concern. So the sphere of influence is what you can really impact in your own circles, in your own way. The sphere of concern is where you can redirect your dua because it's something that concerns you. So impact is like direct action and then concern would be dua. So I would say your direct action is to warn your loved ones that you trust who are not going to turn on you and, you know, put draw unnecessarily attention to you and your sphere of concern is yeah Allah please protect my community from the harms of these types of people or individuals or if this person is good uh you know make them veil them or or make it apparent to people um maybe they are not known for their goodness yet but always have the good opinion first you know ask for the khair of people instead of you know the wanting them to just disappear or, or whatever you know we we always should want good for one another and, and just make your dua for the protection of the people and the benefit of the people and uh, leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the sphere of concern and, I'm uh, sorry, the sphere of, um, what is it? No, I forgot the sphere of, what, what was the two? I'm totally blanking. The sphere of impact? No, I'm, I don't know what I said. I don't know. Asad al do you remember? I'm completely blank right now. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me. Anyway, I'm sorry, I was reading influence. questions. I'm sorry. No, no, it's influence. okay. Influence. In the I'm like, wait, what's the word? <laughs> Human moments, you guys. We have them, subhanAllah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I hope that was a clear answer. Bismillah. Are there other questions? Yes, sorry. I was just waiting for a quiet moment in the room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about the celebrity culture when it comes to the current scholars? How not to step over boundaries, following them literally, virtually, and how close can we get to them? What's the safe distance? 
Uh, that's a very another very great question, Jazak Jazakilohir. And I think um, you know, one of the things that we want to be very cautious about is falling into this um unfortunate thing that can happen where we, we become um obsessed or, or, or obsessive or just too emotionally attached to people, um, even if they you know have um an impact on us, they're there, we feel a spiritual connection to them. We always want to make sure that we see them as a means, as a door, right? That they they're just a suburb. If we get too fixated on the personality worship or the individual, you know, and, and their their celebrity, their awe, their whatever draw that Allah's given them, it's very dangerous spiritually. And I've seen this over the years happen to people, unfortunately, where um, they become, you know, it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem, especially if, if it's a female to male or male to female sort of dynamic that can be very dangerous. Um, you can start to have unnatural and, uh, you know, inappropriate thoughts. Shaitan likes to play on our vulnerability. So when we um, you know, have a, a, an attachment or a draw to someone. We want to keep a safe dis distance, right? And I think the most important thing is to have awe, heba. Heba is a really beautiful word. I don't know if there's even an English equivalent, but it's just to see the teacher um, with this reverence and respect, not for them per se themselves, but rather for the, the the signs that you that they're manifesting that emanate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The gifts that Allah's given them. So it always goes back to Allah. So if you hear a beautiful speaker, even like like reciters, let's say there's a beautiful reciter, right? Someone who just moves your heart. If you can just see them as being uh, you know, that Allah has given them those talents, that Allah's given them those abilities, and look beyond them, and you give the praise and awe that's really due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you won't get fixated on the individuals. You just see them as means, right? And this is where also like the hadith um, that the uh, scholars or the warath uh, al-anbiya, right? That they're the inheritors of the prophets is also another beautiful way to kind of see them as part of a general category of people, right? We have the awliya, we have the prophets who are the elite of the elite, and then we have the saints, right? The, the people who are their inheritors. But if you just start seeing them, that, that these are just a special group and category of people that Allah has gifted with these gifts and these attributes, then um, you don't get, you don't individualize, you don't in fixate on the individual. Shaitan wants all us to kind of, you know, hone in on, on the person themselves, right? So that we forget that they're just manifestations of God's power and qudra. They're not to be worshipped and to be awed and to be revered for their own individual traits. Because nobody, nobody's self-made, nobody's self-produced. None of us, none of us no matter what we've accomplished, no matter what we've done, no matter what we will do, none of us can make a claim that this was all us, right? So we shouldn't see people in that same light. We should just see them that Allah just gave them those gifts. And I love Allah and Alhamdulillah, we're Muslim. And that creates a natural, healthy boundary so that you catch yourself like you shouldn't be up three o'clock in the morning watching videos of someone, you would know that that's just weird. You know, that's a little too much, you know, but if you're, I mean, unless you're like, you know, writing a paper, you're doing something very serious, but I mean to say like, you're just staying up at night and kind of consuming and consuming and consuming, this would be uh, certainly um, a, an, an indication of something else going on. So inshallah, inshallah that was clear. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Now questions are coming. So I live in a small town and we don't have learned scholars here. For example, um, they disparage Imam Ghazali. How can we not despair when we don't have reliable people to ask when we have questions and we can't and we have to sort of resort to shift Google? Yeah, subhanAllah. Just like Allah, may Allah make it easy. It's very difficult when you don't have community. And I feel like there's so many answers I would love to give you. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is make hijrah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you an opening out of that uh, environment into a place where you feel more supported. And inshallah, of course, he can change our circumstances instantly. So you should always ask for khair in that way. And if you feel like it's really becoming difficult or 
to practice your faith openly or in a way that you feel really supported, then just rely on Allah and he can make a pathway open for you. And that is absolutely, um, you know, an answer. The other thing would be to, again, and I'll, you know, remind us all, as we mentioned before, to really lean on organizations that you do find trust in, like the Rahma Foundation or any other organization where you feel like this is a place where there is sound knowledge being transmitted. I trust the people because they are displaying trustworthiness. They're showing me clear signs that these are, they have nothing to hide. They're very transparent. Their credentials are all known. So rely on those people. And then as far as your community, I know it's difficult because you see these um, things, but you just have to remember that this is a very confusing time. There are a lot of people who are unfortunately ignorant and that's not um, necessarily their fault. We have people who have been heavily influenced by certain groups. You know, um, they 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 have power, they have money, they have wealth. They know how to, you know, expand their empire. I guess you could say, and perpetuate their misinformation and uh, ignorance upon our ummah. And so we have to just, you know, realize this is just a, a time where, with the internet especially that we have a lot of confusion. But when you see those lighthouses, right, in the in the vast darkness. Um, uh, that, that are standing tall, that those are from Allah to help us not to fall into despair and darkness. We should never fall into despair. Just hold on to the lighthouse. Know them, see them where they are. And at all times, know, you know, instead of necessarily Sheikh Google, I wouldn't recommend um, free, freely kind of just open, uh, you know, source kind of ways of getting Islam because you don't know where that information is being generated from look to organizations again, especially on very specific questions. Um, there are things that we need to vet and make sure that you're getting the soundest answer for you. Um, and so you can turn to those same organizations and hopefully they have a portal or some means of being able to ask questions. There are uh, other more reliable sources, like for example, um, you know, one of the common platforms that I use um, for uh, general fifth questions, and I always think people should use them, is Seekers Guidance. They have a Q&A, and they have um, opinions uh, that are from the Hanafi, the, the Maliki, and the Shafi school. I think they may have uh, some occasionally, uh, some Hanbali positions, but they have teachers that are trained. Uh, they have their ijazas in these different respective schools of thought. And so when they're looking at general Q&A, like everyday to, to, today kind of stuff, right? Muamalat, like the, the fiqh of, of like transactions, the fiqh of just day-to-day -day stuff, they will present um, the opinions of, of the, the houses, I mean, the schools of thought, and you will get sound knowledge. And there's so much there. They have like hordes of, of answers. So you can use their search function, um, seekers guidance. And then I'm sure there are others, but that's what comes to mind now. Uh, and I would just, again, say, trust the organizations that you um, that you trust to also be able to help you. Uh, and and make uh, dua that Allah opens the means for you, inshallah, to be more supported or to either to, for you to make hijra to a better community or for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring good people to your community, inshallah. I mean, Ya Rabbin Adami. Last question. Assalamu alaikum. How can I learn to tame my nets? I've become aware to the fact that I sometimes do things and uh, don't know if my intentions are pure. Or comments will get to me and when I was doing well the comments cloud my mind and I don't want to do the act that I was doing. How do I stop letting my naps overpower me and stay true to the right path? Mashallah, this is a very good question because it allows us to um, first of all all of us should you know find some um, uh, some um, I guess consolation or comfort because these are very shared experiences. I think the self-doubt that many of us are riddled with when we're kind of second guessing our question is such a commonly shared experience. But alhamdulillah, our scholars have given us guidance on that. If you at the onset of an action are pure, have pure intention, and then along the way, a thought enters your mind um, and you start to now wonder what was my intention. These are all the machinations of shaitan. This is how he works, right? He he tries to confuse us, but you have to go back to your preliminary intention, right? So there's even, I think, in Purification of the Heart, this example is given. Like if you're going to the masjid and you make a sincere niya, you want to go pray uh, your, in the masjid. You just want to make your, you know, your niya pure. And you start walking. And then along the way, this thought comes to your mind that, ooh, maybe people will see me, right? But you're rejecting that thought, right? It, it bothers you. This is, this is a good sign of your iman. And you would not 
um, you shouldn't worry that, oh, now was my prayer really for the sake of Allah or was it for being seen, right, ostentation. Um, those are all thoughts that you have to reject because your original niya is what counts and we cannot control the stream of consciousness. Our thoughts, right, this is why it's important to also study the four uh, khawatir, the, the streams of, of uh, thoughts that we have as human beings because it helps you to know, I can't control all the thoughts that I have, right? So I'm not gonna sit here and let uh, self-doubt riddle, or, or I mean, you know, um, become an obstacle for me. Because you, if, you, if you let that uh, thought process play out, it ends up being so distracting. And then at some points it can be immobilizing. Like you don't even want to do anything because you're just like, well, what's the point? My intentions are so bad, you know? And that's exactly what Shaitan wants. So, um, but the four khawat that are, Right, the Khatar Nafsani, uh, Khatar Rabbani, uh, Khatar Shaitani, and Khatar Malikani. Now, the Nafsani and Shaitani are obviously the two sources of evil thoughts, right? Evil inspirations. And then Malikani and Rabbani are from uh, the angels and Allah directly. So those are the four sources of where we get our thoughts from. Now, when it comes to Shaitan and Nafs, they work together. So Shaitan wants us to prevent us from doing better actions, right? So he will want to cast doubt in us so that we don't want to aspire. Um, and nefs will just perpetually, you know, get us to do the same repeated terrible things or bad things that we've been doing because we're habituated to them. So they're, they're a little different in the way that they operate, but anything that, um, you know, prevents you or thwarts you from a path of good and then directs you to something worse would be considered a demonic thought. So if you get, if those types of thoughts demoralize you and now you don't even want to do them, then you would certainly say that that's from shaitan. But the way to control it, and actually Shaykh Hamza gave a beautiful answer recently um, uh, about this, where someone was asking a similar question, like, how can you overcome the nafs? And, and he just kind of said, you know, like he was referencing his experience with his teachers and Mauritania and the people that he learned from. And he said, just ignore it. Like the nafs is, is you know, the, the, the people that he, he studied with, they didn't pay that much attention to it. And I thought that was such an amazing perspective because what he's saying is that the more you spotlight the nafs, the more control you give it. So it's better to basically ignore it, just realizing that it's going to constantly try these different tricks to get you, but don't em uh, empower it with attention, right? Because if you uh, suddenly become aware of it and it's like, oh, now did I do this? Did I do that? Did I do this? All of that is kind of giving it too much attention and then it starts to, you know, take over you. But whereas if you just see it like a nagging little fly, right? That's just buzzing around and it's trying to get you to, to basically turn your focus away from Allah by getting you consumed with all this self-doubt, then you learn to swat it away. And this is where all the B'dayim and Shaitan comes to mind. And you just constantly rely that Allah's so kareem. I mean, when I, for example, think of, you know, the, the plethora of hadith where he's constantly giving us hope, you know, hope after hope that not to worry so much. I mean, it's it's a very delicate balance, right? Because we have to have taqwa, um, you know, uh, raja, hope, and we also have to have fear, right? Uh, khawf, these are the two wings, right? We have to be balanced in our approach. But when you read those hadith, it's kind of just to give you peace of mind that don't overthink and overanalyze and let your mind become so consumed to the now you, you feel like nothing is purely done. Because it's something for the rest of our lives Every single person, no matter what level of knowledge or spiritual height they reach, they will always have to purify their niya. We all have to do it. Uh, so inshallah, may Allah make it easy. Just remember your original niya to do something. If it's with conviction, if it's for the sake of Allah, then don't worry about any thoughts that start to cascade along the way. Just be, uh, be convinced that Allah knows what your original niya was. And inshallah, be pure uh, in that regard. May Allah make it easy. I mean. And yes, someone is asking too about the Arabic terms for the four streams of consciousness. What I'll do is, um, they're, they're the khawatir, rabbani, malikani, nafsi, and shaitani. But what we can do is, maybe if you can remind me next class, I can write them out for you and uh, and give you more on that. So, jazakum uh, I know we went over today, mashallah, I 
Um, I tried to um, stop uh, before so we could have more time for Q&A, but alhamdulillah, we had a lot of good questions. So thank you for staying on longer. Thank you to everyone else for also being here. May Allah increase and reward all of you. Uh, please do support the Rahma Foundation. And those of you who are on Instagram, join us next time on uh, Zoom, but look into this class uh, through the Rahma Foundation. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal'asr inna l'insana la fi khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا الحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهدوا أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا everyone thank you so much inshallah we will see you next week um, and tomorrow, by the way, for those who are, who are on Instagram, I'll be back for the six points of tabligh, uh, inshallah. All right. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa